Good afternoon, Smith Terps. My name is Jeff Williams, the Director of Alumni Engagement here at the Smith School. I am pleased to be kicking off our new webinar series brought to you by the Office of Alumni Relations that aims to help alumni like you achieve your personal and professional goals. In these quarterly webinars, we'll bring in expert speakers to give real-world tips to help build your skills in area, areas including intergenerational workplace communication, planning for retirement, networking in the digital age, and of course today's topic, influence at work, the science of getting what you want. During the webinar, we encourage you to use the questions box to share any questions or comments you might have for the presenter. Please feel free to submit questions throughout the session and our presenter will answer them as often as possible. And who is our presenter? Well, joining us today is Dr. Stephen Cohen, a leading expert on public speaking and effective presentation skills. Dr. Cohen is an accomplished scholar and dynamic trainer who has brought research-based insights to clients in a wide range of industries. He is regularly quoted in publications such as the Financial Times, BBC News, Slate, and New York Magazine. He is also the author of two books on public speaking, as well as a collection of thought-provoking articles on the art of developing and delivering powerful presentations. Dr. Cohen previously served as Managing Director of the Oral Communication Program at the University of Maryland, where he led curriculum development, assessment initiatives, and instructor training for a large-scale general education program. Dr. Cohen also spent several years working in the private sector as an Assistant Vice President and Team Leader at Bank of America and a Senior Strategy Consultant at IBM Global Business Services. Dr. Cohen earned a PhD in communications from the University of Maryland, a Master in Public Policy from Harvard University, and a Bachelor of Arts in Business Administration from the University of Florida. He currently holds faculty appointments at the Harvard Division of Continuing Education, the Johns Hopkins Carey School of Business, and the University of Baltimore. Dr. Cohen, I will now turn things over to you. Well, thanks so much, Jeff, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Influence at Work, the Science of Getting What You Want. I'm delighted to be with you today, and today we're going to talk about persuasion and how essentially it's a central part of our daily lives. We use it to convince our friends to eat at a specific restaurant. We use it to entice a client to sign on the dotted line. And we certainly use it to try to convince our boss to give us a raise. So we're constantly trying to persuade others to accept our point of view. And today I want to get to the essence of crafting powerful persuasive messages. My hope is that after today's webinar, you will feel better prepared to influence others to buy your products, services, and ideas. So I'm really excited today to get to the heart of persuasion. And before we get started, I'd love to get a sense of who's on the line. So if you will, in the questions box, if you can type for me, where you're dialing in from today. What city, state, or even country are you dialing in from today? So please just pull up the questions box and type in your answer. Really delighted you're all here. We have some great answers coming in. We have Jason from New York City, Shelby from Baltimore. We have Jonathan, Long Island, New York, Todd from Annapolis. We have Joseph from Den Denver, Johanna from Washington, DC, Marianne from Seattle, fantastic. Patty all the way from Fargo, North Dakota, and many others. Wow, Urs all the way from Switzerland. Thank you so much for being here today. And of course, a number of people right here in College Park. Well, welcome everyone. And thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to be with us. I promise to make this worthwhile. Let's begin today by talking about the agenda. And we'll have a number of other opportunities to share our thoughts in the questions box. Because I really want to make this as relevant to all of us dialing in as possible. We're going to begin by talking about preparing for the sale. So even if we don't see ourselves in a sales role, it's so important that we think like salespeople. So we're going to begin by talking about how salespeople prepare for a sale so that we can prepare to sell our products, our services, and of course our ideas. Second, we're going to talk about a new framework, or at least a framework that will be new to many of us, called Monroe's Motivated Sequence. This is considered the gold standard in persuasion, and it's a new way that we ought to structure our presentations to make them far more effective and to encourage our audience to say yes to what we're advocating. Then we'll talk about the six principles of influence. 
from a scholar named Cialdini. And Cialdini is an expert in influence, and he's developed these principles that have been tested over time. And I'm going to dive deep into each of them and talk about how we can use them in a business context to advance our arguments and advance our ideas. And at the end of today's seminar, we'll talk about some next steps. Where can we go from here to continue our communication and persuasion journeys? So I hope you're as excited as I am about today's webinar. So let's get started. Let's begin by talking about persuasion. Now, when you think about persuasion, what do you think about? In the questions box, if you could type for me, how would you define persuasion? When someone says that they're trying to persuade you to do something, or as you think about what it means for you and your business to persuade other people, what does that mean to you? In the questions box, if you'll share, please, your perspective on the definition of persuasion. Don says, getting someone else to do what you want them to do. Macarena says, nudging to get someone to do something. Mustafa says, selling. Ron has a different perspective. He uses the word influence, and specifically in decision making. He talks about influencing the decision process. And Todd says he agrees with Don. Fantastic. Well, many folks, thank you for those, many people think of persuasion in terms of convincing others to adopt a particular point of view. We think about persuasion in terms of we have something to sell and we want other people to buy it. But persuasion is really about something else. And this is how I want to frame persuasion today. Persuasion is really about identifying and satisfying needs. It's about thinking about what our audience needs and finding ways to satisfy those needs. Look, just because we have a great product or idea to sell doesn't mean that people will care about it. We have to make them care about it by showing them how it will satisfy their needs. That's ultimately how we will get what we want. So the key question for us to think about today and to ask ourselves about our customers, our clients, our colleagues, what's keeping them up at night? What's on their mind? What problems are they facing that they think about when they go home at night and it's still on their mind when they come to work the next day? That's ultimately what we mean by needs. Needs essentially are problems. Needs are issues. Needs are challenges that people have in organizations. And if we're going to be successful as persuaders, if we're going to be successful as leaders, we have to create alignment between what our colleagues or clients need and what we have to sell. If we can find that alignment, we're going to have far more people saying yes to us than we ever have had before. So that's why I want to look at persuasion today. Johanna asks a great question. She says, do you think the principles you are sharing today are applicable to one-on-one -on -one conversations as well as public speaking? Johanna, great question, and yes, absolutely. The segment on Monroe's Motivated Sequence will focus on persuasion, but then the principles of influence we'll talk about a little bit later certainly are directly applicable to one-on-one -on -one conversations and meetings as well. So you're in the right, appreciate your being here. Great question. Let's move on now and talk about preparing for the sale. Now, just like a salesperson would prepare for a sales meeting or an opportunity to sit down with the client, we need to prepare for every presentation and every communication interaction just like a salesperson would. The first step in that process is to think about what we have to sell. Sometimes it's obvious because sometimes it's a discrete product. It may be office furniture. But other times it could be a service, perhaps a haircut. And other times it could be an idea such as a new way to streamline a process in an organization. The key, though, is to be able to articulate it clearly and crisply. We have to believe in what we're selling, and we have to be able to talk about it in a compelling way. So I want to make this webinar as relevant to as many of you as possible. So if you will, in the questions box, tell me what you're selling. In a single sentence or in a phrase, what is it that you spend most of your day selling? Or what is it that you're trying to sell right now? It may be a specific product, it may be a specific service, or it may be an idea or a proposal that you have in your organization or perhaps some sort of government or public policy. 
So if you can, in the questions box, and again, try to be as specific as you can, so I can use some examples later in the webinar to make these ideas even more relevant to you, share with all of us what you're trying to sell. We have some interesting responses coming in, very varied here. Philip says real estate. Justin says he's trying to sell his, himself. He's actively looking for a job. Fantastic. Jonathan says he's trying to get a raise. <laughs> Aren't we all? Kate says land conservation services. Interesting. Johanna, ways for governments to more sustainably manage ocean resources. Really interesting. Stephen is talking about process improvements and changes that he wants to make in his organization. Devin is selling mergers and acquisitions advice. Really interesting. And Patty is selling tax planning and preparation services. So you can see here that there are a variety of different ways of looking at what we're trying to sell. One of the challenges that I see in organizations all the time as I do training and consulting in a wide variety of companies around the around the country is this need to be able to clearly and passionately articulate what we're selling. If we can do that in a clear and convincing way, people are going to understand it and be more excited about it. Second, we want to make sure that we understand our customer base. Who are they and what do they believe? We call the who are they part demographics and we call the what do they believe part psychographics. Now certainly we understand perhaps who's going to be in that room, but we need to learn as much about them as possible, especially in that psychographics component, especially in the part about what they believe. Because if we understand what they believe and what they care about, we'll be able to draw a deeper connection between what we're selling and what they need. So some ways to do this. Certainly there's social media, looking at LinkedIn and Twitter, making sure that we perhaps visit any personal blogs they have out there to learn about their interests, their hobbies, any pets they may have, any side interests they have. That's so critical for learning about who's in the room and catering our presentation to them. We certainly could visit a company website and look at mission and value statements. But even more than that, let's look at the news tab. Let's try to get a sense of what's been happening in that organization. So even if we're not talking to a few people, but it's a large room of people, we have an idea of what's on their mind. In other words, the news section of a website can help us answer the question, what's keeping them up at night? And that's a great way to make our presentation more relevant. One of the best ways, though, one of the best ways to get information about our audience is to ask the person who invited us. That person who we call the event organizer can provide such critical information that person knows what's keeping the audience up at night. That, uh, that person knows why we've been invited and what gaps we can help fill. So we want to take advantage of the opportunity to speak with that person, not just about the logistics of the event or the logistics of the meeting, but to understand what's on our audience's mind so we can help identify those pain points and ultimately make sure that our message or our presentation addresses and, and solves as much as we can those pain points directly. That will help us be far more successful. And that's really putting a magnifying glass to the issues that are affecting our audience members. Finally, we want to determine what we want to achieve. What's our goal? What's our goal? It would be silly to go into a business meeting without having a discrete goal. Now most of the time we would think, oh, we want to sell. We want to make the sale. But that's not always our goal for a particular presentation. Sometimes we want to get a follow-up meeting. Sometimes we want to get an introduction to someone else. And other times we just want them to review the proposal or review the contract and come back with potential questions. So it's so important that we go through these three steps in any sales interaction, in any presentation interaction, that we not only are able to clearly articulate what we're selling, but that we spend some time trying to understand who our audience is and ultimately what we want to achieve. Because if we do that, our presentation will be far more focused than it ever has before and we'll be able to more clearly address the question, what's keeping our audience up at night and what can I do to make their lives easier? The more we're able to make their lives easier, the more our audience is going to want to buy or buy into 
what we have to sell. Johanna has a really interesting question here. She says that her challenges come more from being able to persuade and influence her colleagues. In other words, sell her ideas internally. Johanna, thank you for that. And please feel free to keep your questions and comments coming at any time in the questions box. You don't have to wait till I pause. I want to make sure to address as many of your questions and comments as possible. But Johanna, you're not alone. A lot of us are constantly trying to persuade our colleagues. And so the key here is to get inside the minds of our colleagues. We probably know them better than we'll know a random or external audience. So we'll want to learn about their hobbies and interests. We want to know their leadership behaviors and qualities in the sense of do they get easily rattled or do they get stressed out? And if so, by what? Because the best way, Johanna, we can bring value to them and to our organization is to help them address those needs, to help them solve those issues. So by figuring out what's bothering them and making sure that we cater our presentations to make their lives easier, they'll be more receptive to our ideas and more likely to do what we want them to do. Great question, Johanna. Thank you. Let's move on now and talk about Monroe's Motivated Sequence. And I know there's going to be a number of questions during this segment because this is often very new to a lot of people who are exposed to some of the theories in persuasion for the first time. So please, at any time, if I say something you want a little more clarification on or want some examples, please feel free to share questions or comments in the questions box. So Monroe's Motivated Sequence is considered the gold standard in terms of how to structure a presentation. Now researchers have found a significant difference when it comes to the audience remembering content. So using this five-step structure that I'm about to introduce can make a huge difference in how in our audience's ability to remember what we're saying during a workplace presentation. Now the five steps I'm going to talk about today are attention, need, satisfaction, visualization, and action. Now using these five steps in this order will help us hit the target. It will help us achieve what we're trying to achieve in terms of sales. Let me explain the framework and then I'm going to give you a little case study to help make it come alive so we can see how it works in practice. Now every presentation we give when we're trying to persuade or influence others ought to be structured this way through these five steps. The first thing we want to do is get our audience's attention. Audiences are fickle. We have a limited amount of time to capture their attention and imaginations. So we want to capture it right at the start. And I'll talk about how to do that in just a few moments. Then we want to talk about the need. What problem are they facing? What issue are they facing that we can help solve? Notice that we haven't yet introduced our product, our service, or our idea. Because the truth is they don't care. All they care about is what's on their mind. So before we talk about what we're selling, we first have to make them feel pain. We have to identify their pain points and remind them what stresses or issues they're having right now, which is the reason we've all come together in the first place. Then and only then do we want to introduce the satisfaction. The satisfaction is the solution. It's what we're selling. It's the product, service, or idea that we're advocating or promulgating. Step four is to help them visualize how their lives will be better when they do what, they, what we want them to do. Whether we want them to buy a product, a service, or adopt our idea, we need to help them imagine, visualize how their lives will be better, richer, happier when they buy or buy into what we're selling. And last but certainly not least, we need to give a concrete action. In other words, we need to tell them what to do next. The, more e the easier it is to do, and the more they can do it right now, the more likely they are to do it. So let's put all these pieces together and understand the motivated sequence more clearly. First, we want to grab the audience's attention. We can do this through a short anecdote, maybe a little story. We can do it perhaps with a captivating statistic, a way to get their interest right away. Perhaps we start with a quotation from our CEO or from a senior executive that reminds everyone why we're meeting today. 
But no matter how we do it, we must grab the audience's attention up front. And it has to be a strong opening. If it's not a strong opening, we'll lose people right away. And they'll begin to pick up their iPhones or their Androids and play on their laptops. So we need to keep them interested right from the start. Let me stop here for a minute because Stephen has a question about the attention step that's actually quite good. He says, do you find that the attention step is sprinkled throughout your presentation or conversation due to limited attention spans of people? If so, how can that be done in the middle? Well, Stephen, at least here what I'm saying is we want to get their attention right up front. But certainly, Stephen, you're right. We constantly want to be inserting stories or ideas that get people excited and interested. In other words, Stephen, we always want to answer the question with them. W-I-I-F-M, what's in it for me? That's the question, Stephen, we always want to be answering. What's in it for me? The more we can make it relevant to our listeners and the more we can reinforce how and why it's relevant to our listeners, the more people are going to engage and re-engage in our presentation. Thanks for that. So back to Monroe's motivated sequence. We talked about the attention step. The second step is called need. In other words, the need step is where we talk about the problem or issue the audience is facing. Now, a lot of my students and the executives that I train all over the country often think that here's where we need to talk about the solution. But actually, we don't want to talk about the solution in step two. We want to talk about the pain that our client or colleagues are experiencing. Remember, nobody cares about what we're selling until they feel a need. That's why in step two, we need to talk about the need first. We need to make people realize that there's some issue in their life that they're struggling with. There's some pain point. There's some inefficient process. There's the fact that product sales are lower than expected, or our top line revenue growth is not hitting our numbers, or our, our, our expenses are way over budget. Whatever the problem is, we need to push on it, just like as though we were pushing on someone's shoulder or arm over and over and over again. It kind of gets annoying if someone were doing that to us. And that's what we need to do here, where we remind our audience what pressing need or problem they're facing. Because the more they feel that pain, the more they're going to say, gosh, this is bothering me. I hope you have a solution. And of course you do. And that's step three. Step three is what we call the satisfaction. And satisfaction is essentially where you tell them what we're selling. You explain how your solution, whether it's your product, your service, or your idea, directly addresses that issue, that problem that they're facing. That's where you talk about your product and talk about the features of the product. That's where you talk about your service and explain how it works. That's where you talk about your proposal and the different facets of that proposal. That's step three. That's the right place to talk about what we're selling because by then the audience knows they have a problem and they're more attuned to what we're offering because hopefully it directly addresses the problem we've talked about in step two. Step four is again called visualization. And visualization is where we use imagery, details, case studies to show how our solution directly addresses the problem and how it will make their lives better. So this is where we want to talk about, help them visualize in their minds, how if they only buy what we're selling, or if they only do what we want them to do, their lives will be better, richer, more productive, happier, using side-by-sides before and after case studies, using strong examples, using imagery and details to help bring content to life, like the idea of poking someone over and over again in their arm or shoulder. That's imagery. And that's a way to help people visualize the impact of how buying our product or buying into our idea will help address their needs. Finally, step five is that action step. And that's where we need to help our audience understand what to do now. Remember, the easier it is to do and the more they can do it right now, the more likely they are to do it. So instead of telling people after they go back to their desks to visit a website, ask them to pull out their phones right now or open their laptops right now and go to the website during the meeting. That will boost what we call compliance. Many more people will visit the website if you ask them to do it right then and there. Here's another example. Let's say the action you want people to do is to sign up. 
let's say to join a committee or to join some extracurricular program or volunteer, employee volunteer program. Instead of asking them to email you after the meeting if they're interested, pass out a sign-up sheet and ask them to commit right then and there. The more you can get people to do it before they leave the room, the more likely they are to do it. These small, subtle changes in the action step can have a huge impact in compliance, in the number of people who do what we want them to do. That's the action step. Let's look at a case study now on a product called Proactive Plus. Some of you may have heard of Proactive Plus. It's an acne medication, and you know it's good because it's Proactive Plus. <laughs> and so whether we ourselves have dealt with acne at some time in our life, or whether we have kids or family members who struggle with acne, we all know acne is a problem. It's so interesting to look at case studies or commercials, infomercials for Proactive, because they always start with an attention step. There's always some celebrity or good-looking person who endorses the product, who himself or herself is an acne sufferer. So certainly we all know Adam Levine. Adam Levine is the lead vocalist for a group called Maroon 5. And he's one of the spokespeople for Proactive Plus. And I know some of us stay up late at night and we're just flipping through the channels and we come across perhaps these wonder products, whether it's a new blender, a new frying pan, an ab belt, whatever it may be, it's going to change our life. And Proactive is one of those late night infomercials. And they always start with a celebrity endorsement because they need to capture our attention right away. So putting up Adam Levine or some other celebrity is Proactive's way of getting the audience's attention. The next thing these ads always do is they talk about the problem. They talk about how acne is a problem for people. And they'll have the celebrity himself or herself talk about how they struggled themselves with acne, how they lacked confidence, how they felt insecure. Notice they don't talk about the product yet. They're not they haven't yet introduced Proactive Plus or any of its features. And by the way, I should note, I have no association with Proactive Plus. <laughs> I'm not making any money off them. But I will say that it's always really insightful to look at their ads and to notice how they dwell on the problem. They make that problem, they make that pain obvious. They make us all feel, if we don't, if we're ourselves not dealing with acne, they remind us of what it was like growing up and how someone in our life likely is dealing with acne right now. The third thing the ads do is the satisfaction step. They finally introduce Proactive Plus. They show how nourishing it is. They show how smooth it goes on the skin. They talk about how it will make our skin look and feel amazing. That's the satisfaction step. In step three, they finally talk about the product. And notice they don't talk about the product until they've made us feel that pain in step two, until they've answered the question, what's keeping you up at night? Step four is visualization. This is where they show before and after images. Notice in the image I just put up on screen, this, these, by the way, images are taken directly from a Proactive Plus commercial. You can see how they show the visualization step, how it works. On the left, you have the gentleman before he started the Proactive Plus regimen, and on the right, you have the gentleman after he used the Proactive Plus regimen. And they show a number of these examples with different types of people, men and women, people of different races, ages, and backgrounds, so that we can visualize for ourselves how our lives will be better, happier, how our skin will be smoother and tighter by using the product. And then and only then, in step five, do they tell us what to do now, which is call the toll-free number to order today. What's fascinating about these ads, and I've watched many of these ads for many different infomercials, because infomercials are classic for using Monroe's Motivated Sequence. Our whole life we've been watching these ads, and we probably never realized that they all follow the same structure. And I promise you from now on, you will never look at late night infomercials the same way again, because now you know MMS, Monroe's Motivated Sequence. They always follow this system because, like I said, in persuasion theory, it directly corresponds with the way humans think and the ways of, of creating and solving what we call cognitive dissonance, which is we identify a problem, 
we make that problem obvious, so there's some dissonance creators, created in the listener's mind, and then once the listener has a problem, they're more open to a way of solving that problem. And that's why Monroe's motivated sequence is so effective, because it creates and solves cognitive dissonance. One last thing I'll say about the action step, both in the proactive plus case study and other infomercials and other sorts of business presentations and product pitches, is that the action step in the proactive plus commercial doesn't come on until they've gone through the other four steps. So the toll-free number is not on screen until step five. There's no phone number up on the screen. It's only after the visualization step that for the first time and through the remainder of the ad, the toll-free number is visible on the bottom of the screen. And that's because no one cares about the action step until we've gone through the other four steps. So to review, when it comes to Monroe's Motivated Sequence, for every business presentation that we give from here to eternity, and certainly any time we're pitching an idea, any time we're pitching an idea to our colleagues, our clients, to our boss, whether we want to ask for a raise, whether we're trying to get people to buy a specific product, or whether we're trying to convince our management team to adopt a new process, perhaps a new way of dealing with the credit card processing, meaning from application to sending the credit card to the customer. That's certainly a process that has many different steps. So no matter what it is we're trying to convince people to do, we want to follow this five-step framework. Get our audience's attention. Focus on the need or the problem they're facing. Talk about what we have to offer, what our solution is, and how it directly addresses that problem. Help our audience visualize how their lives will be better, happier, stronger, more productive if they do what we want them to do. And then last but not least, be specific about the action. What do they do next? If we follow Monroe's motivated sequence, I promise you, we'll have a completely different impact on our audience members and will be far more likely to say yes. Let me pause here and see if there are any questions before we move on to the six principles of influence. And feel free, please, to share any questions or even comments you have in the questions box. I'd love to hear what you think of all this and how perhaps we can use Monroe's motivated sequence in our everyday work to accomplish our own goals as well. We have a number of questions coming in here. I really appreciate your feedback. Stephen says, it also seems that identifying a person's potential feeling is more impactful than just the issue itself. Would you agree? Stephen, great question. Yes, certainly a person's feeling is important. We call that pathos. Pathos is the audience's emotion. And we want to use different types of appeals, different types of arguments. So it's not only do we want to be logical in the arguments that we share, but we also want to get our audience to feel a certain way. We want to use pathos-based arguments. So you're right. Figuring out what will affect people emotionally and injecting or inserting those kinds of stories or ideas into our presentation will also enhance the persuasiveness of our pitch. Great point. Thank you for that. Chad asks an interesting question. He says, do you have any advice on when and how detailed data should be used or not used? Chad, great point. Detailed data should be used in the both the need and the satisfaction step. So we can use data up front to show how deep the problem is. We can show charts and graphs that make our management team, for instance, see that we're struggling as a company in a particular area or that our process is not as effective as we want it to be, or we're not recruiting the number of people that we said we would in quarter one or quarter two, whatever it may be. But data can also be used in the solution step. Perhaps, in, for instance, if we show A and B cases, or if we talk about product performance, to show how specific products or services could boost sales or decrease costs. So absolutely, they're important. But more than that, Chad, the best place for data is in visualization. Although we might use it a little bit in steps two and three, where it really hits home is in step four. Because by helping our audience visualize the impact of our products, services, and ideas through charts and graphs, they'll be far more likely to understand our point 
and to move forward with our idea. Shelby asks a good question. She asks, how do you know when someone is feeling the pain? Well, just like in, if you knock them upside the head, they may get rattled a little bit. The same is true in a presentation. You'll see people looking down or maybe looking stressed. And that's why we want to be cognitive in the moment of audience reactions. But the best way to know is to test our ideas in advance. So going to colleagues and running by them, we call this pre-wiring. It's a consulting term. And pre-wiring is the idea that we always want to test out our ideas before we sell them in the actual pitch. So by pre-wiring the ideas with our colleagues before the meeting, we can ask them, is that compelling? Is that convincing? Or even more than that, do you feel the need to buy in? Do you feel like I've made the point strong enough? So testing out those ideas through pre-wiring and seeing where the gaps are in our arguments can help us figure out whether we need to add more logical appeals or more pathos or emotional based appeals during the actual pitch. Thanks for that. Let's move on now and talk about a few principles of influence. Now earlier, one of the questions I was asked is, how do we use these principles in meetings or in one-on-one -on -one interactions? This is the segment that will be most helpful for you if you don't give a lot of formal presentations because the six principles I'm about to share from Bob Cialdini are useful any time we're trying to get people to say yes. So I want to talk about these six ideas and then give you a business example for each of them to show how they're used or how they have been used in real situations to get people to change their behavior. The six principles I'm going to talk about today are reciprocity, scarcity, authority, consistency, liking, and finally, consensus. These may just be words on a slide now, but in just a moment we're going to see how each of these tools wields tremendous power and can be used for good, I hope, in the world of business, but have unfortunately many times been used for evil. And so I implore all of us on the line today to use them for good, to use them to do important, worthwhile things in our society that get people to say yes, but that ultimately help us achieve really important and worthwhile goals. Let's start with reciprocity. Reciprocity is a really powerful idea. It's the idea that people tend to return favors. People tend to do things for others, but only if they've done it first. In other words, we have to be the first to give. It's not enough to expect that people will give back just because we've given. It's more powerful to understand that people will give back if we've given first. So for reciprocity to be successful, we have to give first. And we have to make the personalized and unexpected. That's really important. So it's not enough to give first. We have to make the gift that we give personalized and unexpected. Let me give you an example from the restaurant industry. Many of us know that at the end of a good meal, sometimes we're at a restaurant and we get a small gift. It could be a fortune cookie, it could be mints, it could be a little liqueur. It totally depends on the restaurant. Now the reason restaurants do is because there are many studies from Cialdini and others where they've shown that giving a little gift first can lead to higher tips. Now this is really interesting. Let's talk about the example of mints. So in one study, Giving diners a mint, one mint, at the end of a restaurant experience typically led to tips, rather led to an increase in tips by 3%, just 3%, okay? Now, if the restaurant gives us two mints, if the waiter, rather, or waitress gives us two mints at the end of a meal, the study showed that tips increased by 14%. That's a big increase. Here's the kicker. This is really powerful. If the waiter provided one mint, walks away, and then comes back and says, for you nice people, I'm going to give you a second mint, tips skyrocketed by 23%. That's the power of reciprocity. Even though in examples two and three, the waiter gave the same number of mints. He gave or she gave two mints each time. The fact that in the third case study, 
the waiter made it more personalized and it was unexpected, led to a far greater increase in tips than if the waiter had just given the same number of mints, two mints, the first time. So by walking away and saying, for you nice people, here's an extra mint, that led to a 23% increase in tips. That's almost, that's a huge increase if you think about how much we leave after a meal. So reciprocity has big results. So in the workplace, we want to think about how we can be the first to give, and we want to make sure that any gifts we give are personalized and unexpected. That will make people want to give back and, and, and to reciprocate what we've given them, whether it's through repeat business or whether it's through supporting our ideas or our proposals. Macarena is asking me to repeat those numbers. Yep, one mint, tips increased by 3%. Two mints, tips increased by 14%, and then giving one mint, walking away, and then coming back to give a second mint, increased tips by 23%. That's according to one of the studies in Bob Cialdini's book, Influence. Let's move on now and talk about scarcity, the second principle of influence. Scarcity is the idea that people tend to want more of something when there is less of it. Many of us may remember the Tickle Me Elmo phenomenon. Tickle Me Elmo was this doll that everybody won, and parents were going crazy in Toys R Us and other, other toy manufacturers, or rather retail stores, trying to get one of these things for their children. And there are many situations in the business world where people pay ridiculous prices for things when there isn't a lot of it. So the notion of scare in the business context is that we want to mention what our listeners stand to lose if they don't buy or buy in to what we're selling. So although many times we frame things in social science talking about what people will gain if they do what we want them to do, the notion of scarcity flips this idea on its head and it says if we want to get people to buy or buy into what we're selling, we actually want to focus on what they stand to lose if they don't do it. This is a very well-established principle in social science, actually one of the most well-established principles, that people are more receptive to what they t stand to lose than what they stand to gain. So we want to talk about and remind people what will happen if they don't buy our product, if they don't buy our service, or if they don't buy into our idea. Let me give an example from the airline industry. So in 2003, British Airways announced that they would no longer offer a specific route from London to New York. They decided they were ending their service from London to New York on their Concorde flight. And this is something that Cialdini writes about in his book. It's really fascinating. And he talks about that following their announcement, following this announcement, sales of this route skyrocketed. People were buying tickets left and right for London to New York for no other reason except the fact that it was being canceled. That's it. The sheer, the sheer fact of scarcity completely changed the desirability of the route on this British, that British Airways was offering. That's the power of scarcity. When there isn't a lot of something, people want it. I know it seems counterintuitive. Why would people suddenly buy more tickets on this route? Clearly, there was a reason British Airways was ending it in the first place. But the fact that there was less of it increased its desirability. And that's why scarcity is so powerful. That's why people will pay ridiculous sums of money for Beanie Babies or certain toys or certain products or tickets, whether it's to see Hamilton in New York or whether it's to go to a baseball game when it's sold out. Let's say it's the World Series because there isn't a lot of it. So we want to think about how can we strategically make things scarcer in our organizations. The third principle is called authority. And authority is the idea that people tend to defer to experts. We tend to follow the knowledge and advice of people who we consider to be experts in the field. So to use authority, we want to convey our knowledge and credibility before making an ask. So we want to make people understand that we're experts in a certain field before we ask for the business or before we ask them to sign on the dotted line. One good example comes from the real estate industry, and this is fascinating. And by the way, you're noticing here that all the ideas I'm giving are low cost or free. 
These don't cost anything to do. So by making subtle or little changes to our behaviors and to the way we behave in organizations, we can have a huge impact on our results. So looking in real estate, one real estate firm decided that when people, prospective clients would call in, instead of just getting the real estate agent on the line, they trained their assistants to vouch for the real estate agent's credentials and expertise before transferring the call. So for instance, in the past, people would call into this real estate firm and say, hey, can I speak to an agent? And they'd say, sure, let me pass you on to John Smith. But now what they had their assistants do is say, thank you for your interest. I'm going to transfer you to John Smith. He's one of our top performing real estate agents. In fact, he had the best year ever last year. Let me get John right on, on the line right away. So when they made this slight change, and when they began to talk about specific people's credentials or experience, there was a huge impact in performance. In fact, this, this alone resulted in a 20% increase in appointments and a 15% increase in signed contracts. Isn't that incredible? Just by changing the way they answered the phone and talk, getting them to talk, getting the assistants to talk about the real estate agent's credentials and expertise before transferring the call to the agent, it led to a huge boost in signed contracts and in-person appointments. That's the power of authority. People tend to defer to experts. So if they feel the real estate agents are credible and experts in their field, people are more likely to say yes and do what we want them to do. The same thing is true if you think about walking outside, if let's say we're outside taking a walk one day and we see a firefighter with a boot collecting money, let's say for a specific charity. We're far more likely to give to the firefighter than we are to just a person on the side of the street because he or she is wearing a uniform. So uniforms are another example of authority. Whether it's a doctor's white coat or whether it's a firefighter's uniform, we tend to defer to people wearing uniforms and in positions of authority. Let's move on to another principle here, and that's the principle of consistency. Consistency is the idea that people like to follow through on their commitments. So if people say they're going to do something, they're far more likely to follow through on it and actually do it. So the key is to get people to publicly and voluntarily make commitments, ideally in writing. This is why earlier I talked about this idea of getting people to sign on in a sign-up sheet in a meeting is really powerful because they've already committed to it. Now we won't get 100% compliance, but by getting people to commit to something in advance, especially if they do it when other people are watching and they do it on their own accord, they're far more likely to follow through. So if we get people to say, I'm going to vote, yes, of course I'm going to vote in this election, they're far more likely to vote because they've committed to voting. An example from the business industry comes from the healthcare space, and this is this notion of making appointments. Now when we leave the doctor's office, we tend to get an appointment card that looks like the one on screen, and typically we get this appointment card and the reason the receptionist will write it out for us is that we're more likely to follow through on our appointment. So what Cialdini and other scholars have done is they changed the way that health centers would handle this process. Instead of getting the patient, uh, rather, excuse me, instead of asking the receptionist to write down the appointment information, they changed the process and they would hand the appointment card to the patient and get the patient to write down the details of his or her next appointment. So again, instead of having the receptionist write out the, res the appointment card, they would have the patient write out the appointment card and, and have the patient, him or herself, write down the date and time of the next appointment. This little change led to an 18% decrease in missed appointments. 18% decrease in missed appointments. It's really incredible. Think about the revenue impact of 18% decrease in missed appointments. Just by getting patients to write down the information themselves instead of having the receptionist do it. That's the power of consistency. And it's really, really powerful. So we want to think about these things as well when we're thinking about our own businesses. Let me pause here for a moment and see if there are any questions or comments. There are two more I want to share but I just want to see what's on your mind before we continue. 
Johanna says, my dad had a hair replacement business and was about to go under. Someone told him, double the price, and his business skyrocketed. Huh, very interesting. So there we see this notion of making something more valuable because there's less of it. So you seem to be talking about scarcity there, Johanna, the idea that it's about to go out of business. So by making it less scarce, or rather, excuse me, by making it more scarce, customers responded differently. Very interesting. Johanna says, yes, scarcity. Excellent point. Macarena here shares an interesting set of questions. She says, are you suggesting that perhaps something should be made artificially scarce? Is that what restaurants do when they don't fill all their tables? Macarena, a fantastic question. So yes, it is possible that some restaurants do this. Perhaps they won't open a section of the restaurant. And so there are longer lines, and people tend to react differently to longer lines. When we see longer lines, we must think something's going on. It's kind of like when we're at a carnival, and we see a group of people surrounding perhaps a street performance. We stop, and we want to see what everyone else is doing. That's not the notion of scarcity. That's called consensus, and we're going to get to that one in a minute. But there's a reason. It could be, in your example, that yes, there's less of it, so people want it more. But your other question is really interesting about whether something should be made artificially scarce. Sometimes people do this. If you think about oil and, and the impact on gasoline prices, certainly there have been accusations of manipulation in the certain segments of the oil industry and whether gas prices at some points in the past several years have been made artificially high. But that's more on the unethical side. Certainly the way that companies would handle this ethically is they'd have different products at different price points or categories. So they might have a premium product that they offer less of at a higher price point. Perhaps, let's say, at a movie theater, they'd have movie tickets that come with a adult beverage, perhaps, or with popcorn or a meal. So they have some movie theaters selling tickets, let's say, for $20 with comfortable leather seats and with uh, table side service. And then they offer the traditional movie tickets just for the average moviegoer, let's say, at $10. And so that's creating scarcity in one dimension because there are fewer seats available at the higher price point so companies can charge more. So thinking about what we call product segmentation and thinking about the appropriate price points is one way that companies respond to scarcity. And Justin gives a great example. He says, think about QVC. He says that QVC, QVC shows always say, we only have 10 left of these items to increase sales. Justin, great point, and you're right. That's why companies do that. They say, call now. Within the, the first 100 people that call will get a free gift. And so everyone, they want to get people to rush to their phones to buy the product right now because they want to get people to act in a certain way. Scarcity changes behavior. Absolutely right. Well, let me move on here and talk about the next principle. We have two more, and I want to get through these before the end of the webinar. Great. I see a ton of questions coming in, but let me get through liking first. Liking is the idea that people often say yes to people that they like. So the more that we like somebody, the more likely we are to do what we want them to do. So the key is we want to find and emphasize similarities. The more we can make ourselves seem similar to somebody else, the more they're going to like us. So similarities is the key. Part of liking is to give genuine compliments. We don't want to make up compliments and say, oh, you look nice today, or, or did you get a haircut? It looks great, if we don't mean it, because people can see through that. But one ways to get people to like us are to find and emphasize similarities, things we have in common with people, and to give genuine compliments. So one example, if you think about this notion of liking, is certainly in, in real time, if you think about negotiations. So sometimes negotiations take place through emails, and other times negotiations take through in person. So in one series of negotiation studies carried out by MBA students at a well-known business school, one group was told, time is money, get straight down to business. And when they did this, only 55% of the groups were able to come to an agreement. But in another group, when the organizer said, before you get down to business, spend some time socializing with each other, getting to know each other, figuring out what you have in common, before you get down to the negotiation, 
90% of the groups were able to reach agreements, and the agreements were worth 18% more to both parties. That's the power of liking. So before getting down to business, even though that's a very Western way of doing business, we can learn something from our friends in other cultures and, company, uh, and countries excuse me, by focusing on liking, focusing on emphasizing similarities. Think about that change. 90% of the groups versus 55% were able to reach agreement when they focused on getting to know each other, finding similarities between them, and just exchanging personal information before they got down to business. We know it works, but so many of us don't always do it. Finally, there's consensus. And consensus is the idea that people tend to consider what they see other people doing. If we see a bunch of people at a carnival looking at a street performer, we're going to look over to see what they're looking at. That's consensus. We tend to consider doing what people around us are doing. So the key is to think about and emphasize what similar people are doing. Think about when we get sick or when we wake up one day and we're like, oh, I don't feel good. I don't know if I should go to work today. We tend to jump online and we'll go to some online website to look up medical advice. And of course, we're most influenced by medical advice that is given, or rather, that is based on someone who's like us, someone who's about our age, someone who's male or female, because we tend to do what similar people are doing. So we tend to take medical advice online and think, oh my gosh, I have this disease, if our symptoms match the symptoms of someone similar to us who's asking a question online. So if you think about the hotel industry, Many times we see a card in our hotel room that encourages us to reuse our towels. Now, many of you may know or may not know that washing towels costs hotels millions of dollars a year. So they have an incentive to get hotel guests to reuse their towels. So when the card just says 75% of our guests reuse their towels, please do so as well, towel reuse increases by 26%. So when it says that most guests reuse their towels, please do so as well, which is what we typically may see, that leads to a 26% increase in towel reuse. But here's the kicker. When the card says that most people who stay in this room reuse their towels, there is a 33% increase in towel reuse. So just by talking about that other people, similar people, stay in the same room, that other people who have stayed in this very room reuse their towels, that gets hotel guests much more likely to reuse their towels as well. That's the power of consensus. So let's review. We've talked about six principles of influence today. We've talked about reciprocity, the idea that we have to give first, and it needs to be genuine and unexpected. We talked about scarcity, that when there's less of something, people want more of it. We reviewed the idea that people tend to defer to experts, to people who are in a position of authority. We discussed this notion of consistency, that when, people, when we get people to commit to something, especially in writing, they're far more likely to follow through on it because they've already committed to doing it. We've explored the notion of liking, that people tend to do things when they like somebody. And we talked about finding similarities is a great way to create liking. And finally, we talked about consensus, the notion that other people will do things when they see other people doing it, especially people who are similar to them. These are Cialdini's six principles of influence, and they have power because just making subtle little changes, low-cost changes, can create a dramatic impact on people's notion, people's likeliness of saying yes. Well, let's end today by talking about where do we go from here. I hope many of us will consider joining a local Toastmasters club. Toastmasters is the largest worldwide speaking organization, and there's a chapter in almost every major city in the world. So no matter where you are, whether you're locally in College Park or in Maryland or in some other state or even some other country, I hope you'll consider going to toastmasters.org. That's toastmasters.org and finding a group of people who are also committed to continuing their communication and persuasion journeys. Certainly, practice is so important in persuasion 
the more we practice these techniques, whether it's Monroe's motivated sequence or the six principles of influence, the more likely or the better we're going to get at it and the more likely we're going to be able to sell our ideas. And Toastmasters certainly can help. I also hope you'll consider picking up a copy of my book, Lessons from the Podium, Public Speaking as a Leadership Art. It's a book I wrote to help people present with power and it contains many of the ideas we talked about today and many more. So if you're trying to take your public speaking or persuasion skills to the next level, this book could be for you. Finally, I hope you'll think about asking a mentor what one thing you could have improved. Often at the end of a sales meeting, at the end of a presentation, we say, hey boss, how did I do? And she might say, oh, you did great. Your presentation was perfect. But if we change the question, and instead of saying, hey boss, how did I do? If we say, what one thing could I have improved? We'll get a very different answer. We'll actually get real feedback. So I hope we'll start to ask people at the end of a presentation, what one thing could I have improved? That will yield some very useful feedback that will help us refine our pitch and make it even better the next time we give it. Because the more feedback we get, the more successful we're going to be. So today we've talked about a number of persuasion techniques, and I really hope we play with them and experiment with them. I know they're new and different for us. Whether we start to structure our presentations differently or start to think differently about professional interactions. The more we use these techniques, the more effective we're going to be at getting what we want. So I challenge all of us to use what we've learned today to change hearts and change minds. Because if you master these techniques, not only will you be able to speak with confidence, but you ultimately will be able to get what you want. Thank you so much, and go Terps! Thank you, Dr. Cohen, and thank you to all of our Smith Terps who attended today's webinar. We will post a recording of today's webinar on YouTube and send it out via email. Uh, we hope you'll join us next month for our next webinar. Please check out our website for more details. Have a great day, and go Terps!